What's going on you guys? It's your Huggable Hipster here and Shastity. Welcome back to Aesthetically Techie. How are you guys doing today? How are you doing Shast? I'm good, I'm good. How's everyone out there doing? Good, I I'm hope. for great. <laughs> <laughs> we did this last we time did. as well. I'm <laughs> Every time. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> We're fine, Woo, I like Pluto, boy. <laughs> oh, I'm, okay. <laughs> Okay, sorry. Listen, I've had way too much coffee. <laughs> it's fine. We're zooming. I had energy drink, uh, Zoa energy drink before, so I'm right there with that you. That sounds like a single soccer mom's energy drink. That's so fancy sounding. Oh, listen. Listen to me, okay? That's Dwayne uh, The Rock Johnson's, his collaboration with Xbox. Um, it's like a healthy energy drink, and I put healthy in quotes, but yeah. Health. Healthy energy drinks brought to you in part by nonsense. <laughs> <laughs> Honestly, like I, the first time that I've ever seen a healthy energy drink, it was water. Okay. Sure. Um, but it is delicious, so that's what counts. Also, drink your water, kids. Stay hydrated. Wash your damn hands. Wear your mask. All the usual suspects. Yes. Today we're going to be talking about some interesting topics. We are going to be discussing representation in gaming, which I feel like it's a very important topic to discuss. Um, I'm sweating just thinking about how this is going to go, but it's all good. You guys <laughs> know my conversations that we have on this podcast are nothing to, you know, it's it's no short of mind tingling because I don't just want to talk about, you know, what I had for lunch today. I want to talk about with Shas, with you guys, mind important topics, things that really make you think. So this is one of them. Um, one thing before we start off this entire podcast, I just want to make sure you guys know, trigger warning, content warning, everything warning, you know, it's put in the title, but I know that sometimes, you know, some people don't read the title, so I just want to say it ahead of time that we all know, okay? Yes. So, and I know that we wanted to go over some definitions before we started, just so people also get an extra bit of content and understand phrase or like more phraseology mm -hmm. throughout this podcast as well. So I know you said you had written down some notes. I there, did. Chastity. I did. So we, we are, yes, talking about representation uh, in gaming, but also we're going to be talking a little bit about racism uh, used as storytelling devices, hence the need for definitions. That way everybody is clear on what the fuck we're talking about. So exactly, uh, racism is prejudice, discrimination, or antagonism directed against a person or people on the basis of their membership in a particular racial or ethnic group, typically one that is minority or marginalized. The belief that different races possess distinct characteristics, abilities, or qualities especially so as to distinguish them as inferior or superior to another. Um, we all know that oftentimes racism is very specific to skin color. Now, let's make something very clear. All skin color is is pigmentation. Uh, this is an evolutionary uh, byproduct that we as humans uh, have that are based off of simply advantages based on environment. So if you live at the equ uh, the equator, a little bit below it, your skin is going to be darker. Why? You get a lot more sun. And that melanin, that skin pigmentation, protects you from the harmful rays of the sun. Whilst those who live in, you know, um, far north or way far south, <laughs> where uh, it's not as, as, as uh, you know, hot and, and, and sunny, uh, they don't need as much melanin. They don't. They don't need that protection as much. Hence, hence their ability to survive really well in the cold. Now, something that often happens uh, is racism and xenophobia. Uh, some people seem to sort of think they're interchangeable. They're not. Xenophobia is a dislike of or prejudice against people from another country. It has nothing to do with skin color. So, those are our definitions. Yeah. Yes. Exactly. Thank you so much. Okay, I appreciate you're that. You're Thank you. Um, so, in, it's 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 been a, an interesting time trying to go about how I want to discuss mm -hmm. these topics, and this all spurred from a, a lot of lovely people, just absolutely wonderful people, messaging me about Fallout <laughs> Three. Um, my voice just went all 1950s there, honey. What did you make for dinner tonight? <laughs> 
<laughs> it's right in the fridge, Margaret. Go fuck yourself. <laughs> I love this. I love this. I love this comedic nervous energy. It's fantastic. <laughs> I know. Oh my god. See, I know it's gonna be self-deprecating humor. We don't have time for that, bitch. Okay. <laughs> Listen. So it's come to my attention that not only have people been messaging me about Fallout Three again, but it's also something of where this has to be a public service announcement at this point, of where I want to reiterate my point on Fallout Three, and then I am done talking about it. I am done mentioning it. If people ask me about my opinion or give me shit for my opinion on Fallout 3, I'm not going to answer you. Point blank, simple as I can make it. Okay? Good. We got it. Great. So my entire point on Fallout 3, it is my opinion. I want to restate that and make it very absolutely clear and just absolutely brutally honest. This is my opinion. You don't like it? That's great. I don't care. We don't have to have the same opinion on everything, you guys. You guys know this about me. So When I say that I don't like Fallout 3 and I discuss how race is represented in Fallout 3 or how things are done in Fallout 3, particularly the bugs, you guys know that I showed video evidence of why the bugs were complete trash in Fallout 3, okay? But besides all of that, um, people think that I'm talking about race in a sense of the ghouls and how they were treated. Um, No, that's not the reason why I was discussing race in Fallout 3. The main things that I were discussing in Fallout 3 regarding race was uh, the first point that I saw it was when I entered into this domain, the place that was supposed to be nuked from a side mission that you could do of this white male who asked you, I'm making the color very clear because people are going to ask me for clarification. So I'm clarifying every little bit as I go. Okay. Um, This male who asked me, okay, we want you to nuke this town. We want you to get rid of it for a sum of caps and caps is the currency within the Fallout universe. Um, and I answered no, I wasn't going to nuke this entire place because I was tr- I was trying to get the good ending, honestly. You know, I never get the good ending. I was trying <laughs> to do that. And then we could... It's true. I always end up getting the bad ending for some reason. I'm just a bitch all around with these types of games. <laughs> I have really bad dick energy, okay? <laughs> I love it. <laughs> but, but when I was trying to, you know, get further on, the... Uh, what was it? The person who was guarding the entire place, the sheriff, if you will, of the town, who is a person of color, he came up to me and was asking me questions and I interacted with the character. And during the cutscenes of the game, they are interactable. This I did not know. I did not know that during times that characters were talking, you could shoot any character you wanted to or, you know, talk with other characters while something was happening. That was interesting to me. So when I saw this all play out, the white male shot the person of color and i thought since oh i can't interact with this cutscene i would let it play out but and i was like wow this is, has like some racist connotations behind it keep in mind this i was recording this also the same week that the george floyd mm. incident happened there was a lot that was going on And my headspace was already wrapped around being pissed off at people pretty Mm. much the entire time. I'm not using that as an excuse or saying that it makes what happened in the game okay, but I'm stating this purely because, uh, you know, we've all had enough of racist connotations, racism, racist ideologies within the world. It was just one more thing adding in the bucket, Mm. okay? So the second thing that I saw within the game, this hits home actually. This for me is something of where as a Jewish woman who is also an atheist kind of like hits hits the bucket in a really bad way of where I saw a poster within where you get to like the part of the wastelands you see a poster within like this tunnel that you go in and it says where will you be when the holocaust Mm. comes for me seeing that and seeing how convoluted the storyline is where one it deals with kind of like this way of dealing with racism, dealing with the bad guys, dealing with this kind of righteous outlook on life, but then you're talking about polluted water and a purification mm-hmm. system? I, I, it, it's so convoluted. So when I was looking at things and then seeing that poster, a lot of the people who I showed it to was like, why would they have a random poster like that with how the storyline is going? So the next thing 
that I saw that had racist connotations to it was or just didn't really sit right. well with me altogether was the way that Chinese people were portrayed within the game. There is this thing in the game uh, when you get to a certain point, it is a simulation to try to find your father. And believe it or not, spoiler warning, I know the uh, your father is actually a dog what? within the simulation, <laughs> which I thought was absolutely <laughs> adorable. <laughs> it was so cute. Like, it was just something where, oh, my dad turns into a dog. Great. Okay. <laughs> Love that. <laughs> so we go, we try to, like, solve this mastermind's, you know, issues and problems, and we do his greedy tasks. And one thing that I actually found out is you can trigger kind of like a, a like a, a program to go off if you touch a certain amount of objects in a house. And I was like, oh, okay, so I can get out of here without actually having to kill anybody. Perfect. Mm -hmm. I'll go for that. And what it unleashed was something called the Chinese Failsafe Program. And what that was, was basically a bunch of Chinese people coming out and shooting everybody and making mocking noises. The, you know, like when people were kids and they didn't know about racism right. and they were just, they would mock like the Chinese right. language and everything like that. It wasn't correct Mandarin. They nice. were mocking the Chinese language. They were creating different sounds. They had them shooting up into the air, shooting different people. That to me was not, it I was see. tasteless and it was not an education whatsoever of the facts. If it were something like Red Dead Redemption, which we'll get into later, where they actually talked about American Indians and they talked about things in a historic manner that would be educational, that would be one thing. But to go about this, and from the points that I mentioned, they were non-sequential. They did not make sense, all of them, and how they would be linked together. Mm -hmm. They seemed too random to be... You know, like, they were just placed there and plopped there just to make a bold yeah. statement to be edgy. And for me personally, that is why I do not like the game. The bugs okay. are a different story entirely. You know, it made it impossible for me to get through certain points. I didn't even think I would be able to change the game or uh, finish the game, rather. But for me personally, that is why I do not like Fallout 3. I know this was long-winded. I needed to explain all of this thoroughly so that anyone who is new understands why I do not like Fallout 3. Bethesda is great at publishing games. They are great at getting them out there, but at creating them right now, for the most part, we've seen what happened with Fallout 76. We know the bugs. We know everything that players even had to go in and mod it themselves because it did not come already with the patches and the mods already done. So we know that Bethesda's games are a little bit, you know, they, they work heavy on the player's end. Um, so as <laughs> leaving this topic, putting, to, putting it to rest, I'm going to say this again. Do not ask me about Fallout 3 or I am just going to not respond to you. I've said it enough. I've said it multiple times. And I don't need to say it again, because any time that someone comes at me, it's not from like a point mm -hmm. of where they want to know anymore. It's from a point of where like, oh, you don't like Fallout 3, right, so I'm gonna right. shit on you. <laughs> As is most haters. <laughs> so, yeah, exactly. So there have been a few people who just want to know my opinion, and they ask me very politely in a direct message, which I respect entirely. But if you come at me publicly, I, I'm just not going to respond. So Right, right. You know, and I, I do want to say this, right? Um, that is, you know, as you said, your opinion of the game and for everyone out there, you know, there is, um, it is okay if someone sees something that makes them uncomfortable to the point that they don't like whatever it is and then go, I don't want to play this. I don't want to support this game, you know? Um, and I think, to attack that person just because you are a fan of, of the game, um, because you had a, I don't know, I, I guess a different understanding of the game, um, is just immature and it's, it's unfair. Uh, and then frankly, what kind of community can we have? What kind of conversations can we have if we can't have different opinions, different viewpoints that we then come together and discuss uh, calmly in a positive manner, uh, and respectfully, uh, you know, I think the best thing about 
uh, about the gaming community specifically is is the ability to go, hey man, this game, I really loved these parts. I really loved this part of the story. This was my favorite scene. This is my favorite character. Uh, I really liked the battle mechanics. You know, and then to have someone say, you know what, I really didn't like the battle mechanics. But you know what I did love? This, you know, and like to be able to have that back and forth is the best part of communities in general, right? So let's stop attacking people for opinions. Let's let's cut that out. <laughs> yeah. And that's that's the thing. You hit the nail right on the head because it's, you know, it's not about disliking something. It's just a matter of like being not, and not even just being opinionated, having your own voice and understanding that, you know, whether you are a person with five followers or 2000 followers, you have your voice and what you like and what you don't like. And I don't feel like people should be belittled or, or even worse, being sent death threats over <laughs> their fucking opinion. Right, which is, which is what <laughs> occurred with you, right? They, they tried to send yeah. death threats, which is is, I mean, calm down, okay? Calm down Honestly. giving death threats from behind your computer. Chill the fuck out, you know? Um, <laughs> but I, I will say this on, on um, just to keep in line with, with, with our theme for the, for the day. Now, it, an argument can be made that the reason why Bethesda chose in, in the storytelling of this game to have kind of these race heavy elements um, is to a set up the sort of the scene, the world uh, in which your character lives. This is a, a, a post-apocalyptic world, but there are very heavy 1940s, 1950s themes to which in, in America, which, Correct me if I'm wrong, Fallout 3 does occur in a post apocalyptic America, right? So, 19. 19- I believe it occurs in post apocalyptic Seattle, but I could be wrong. Do you want to check that out for me really yes, quickly? Yes, I do. Let's see right now. So, Fallout, <clears throat> Fallout 3 setting. Yes. Let's see here. It is. The game takes place uh, in the. after 200 years after the Great War on the east coast of what used to be the United States of America. So mostly Washington, D.C., southwest Maryland, western Pennsylvania, and northeast Virginia. Ah, okay. Yes. So now, with that being said, even though this takes place in the year uh, 2277, (laughs) 2277, uh, yes. Uh, so it ta- it takes place, uh, you know, in the future. However, there's heavy, heavy retro 1940s, 1950s themes. Uh, it sort of echoes this pre-civil rights world. And so argument can be made that the reason why certain uh, aspects of of the game, including that where will you be poster, um, if this is 1940s, that's World War II. That's that's why Holocaust is there. Um, so the 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 argument can be made that this is this is for setting. This is for um, you playing as the protagonist, uh, motivation to go after the enclave and and all that. The, I think the issue here is that by the end you find out that the real issue. Um, with the purification, or I'm sorry, the the purity project is that it actually has to do with the water. It has to do with the water of making things clean because in the Fallout universe, they deal with heavy amounts of radiation, Mm -hmm. which you as the player, you are given doses of radiation throughout it, through the food that you eat, through the people you encounter, through situations. Um, And it it gets to a point of where there is this search for clean water and inhabitable water. There's actually a quote from one of the the characters, the NPCs in the game, where she says, hey, clean water on me after this fight. Mm. Hmm. So to have the to have these kind of like heavy race related themes within it and then to come to the end and find out that actually that has nothing to do with it but setting um that really this is about clean water for there are gamers like myself um, or just, you know, people who enjoy storytelling who will go the extra mile to see the through line 
of how the setting then relates to this, then relates to that. And now we're at this clean water thing. And, and, you know, you can create that timeline there of lore, right? But there's a lot of people. And let's be fair, guys. The majority of people that play games play games for the face value of it. They shut their brain off and they just start clicking away, right? Um, obviously, there are exceptions to this. But for the majority, a lot of people play these kinds of games uh, just for face value. And if, and if you know... It can it can be confusing this the storyline to where then you're not sure what the message is and you know so I think a lot of this is just is really that is confusion as to where these these two kind of points connect uh, and and what what is the reasoning behind having this uh, this setting be technically in the future but have heavy um, influence of the 1940s 1950s. You know, yeah, exactly. Um, so, yeah, I, I think I don't think that Bethesda's goal was to be malicious or to or to or to Honestly, be racist. Yeah. We we see a bunch of their games in which they show representation and amazing storytelling that tells of all kinds of segregation exactly. very well. I think exactly. I think it's fair to just say that maybe this wasn't their best and and. Yeah, and for no. <laughs> you, you were uh, upset by it, which you are valid and empowered to feel. <laughs> you know? Yeah, and the thing is, is that, like, the, a lot of the games that they published, like Wolfstein, The Evil mm -hmm. Within, Doom, they're very good games. And that's the thing of where I don't want you guys to think that this is a Bethesda or Fallout hate fest. I even said right. in my review that the way that they did first and third person... Yeah. In Fallout 3, I think was the first I've ever seen of that because you could switch between that and a game in 2008 really didn't mm. have it that much. Neither did it have the open world concept. I thought that the mutants where they are the bad guys but they're actually helping you through the mutated sections of the game, it's really cool and it's very mm. innovative. But there's just so much for me personally that I feel fell short. And you know what? I'll say it right now and I've said it before and I'm making a promise to you guys. If they do a remake of Fallout 3, I will play it on the channel. Word. Word. So I'm making that promise to you guys because if they fix a lot of the stuff that they need to fix, take out a lot of the um, racial connotations that they have there that are more negative than uh, a lot of us would like mm -hmm. to see, um, then I will absolutely play the game and I would love to see a remake of it and see what they can do, especially with the graphics. Yeah, that I'm nowadays. sure. I'm sure a lot of these games, especially like Resident Evil has really benefited from this, in my opinion, of doing these remakes as technology has has gotten better, you know. Uh, and I think it does it does better for making storyline more clear as well. So maybe that's what Fallout 3 needs. Maybe it needs a remake in order to really make it clear like this um, race heavy, you know, overtone uh, of of the world is simply meant as setting, you know, and maybe a, a motivation um, for for the characters uh, that you know you play or, or your allies uh, and that and then that the real issue is finding clear clean water you, you know maybe a remake will um make that more clear you know um because exactly uh, just to yeah. to um you know give some accolade here to bethesda bethesda came out with an article june 10th 2020 uh about racial equality and the things that they would do to um, you know, support equality across the board. Um, yeah. So just a, a quick thing here. It says our corporate corporate culture is based on the principles of respect, inclusion, and fair treatment. We welcome applicants into our family without regard to race, religion, gender identity, sexual orientation, or age. And we condemn the systematic discrimination and so social injustice that has been a part of American life for far too long, and that provides the catalyst for our current civil upheaval. We want our company to be a positive force in fighting these wrongs, and we want to do our part building a better future for all. So... And, and that comes into where we, you know, we're, we don't think at all that Bethesda itself is mm -hmm. a racist company. You know, there, there, there could have been just things that were messed right. up in translation. 
you know, that, that got lost and miscommunicated and with this convoluted storyline that we see in Fallout 3, I feel like that's what led to a lot of the stuff that happened. And it was basically like the writer's department of anything needs to be the most cohesively built thing in a game company or else you're going to have these types of for things sure, happen, For sure, for sure, you know, and, the, and this is also a, a lesson of like, like allow people to learn and grow, you know, um, people, humans are so fallible, <laughs> so, so fallible. Yeah. Um, and yes, we need to hold people accountable, hold companies accountable, uh, to the, to the things that they do or say. Um, but then we also need to, to allow people room to grow and learn and, uh, and, and to be better, you know? So, yeah, so yeah, exactly. Exactly. I mean, like, that's the whole part of cancel culture, too. You know, I remember whenever people were starting to cancel different game companies. And I always think to myself, what's the point of canceling someone if they can't learn and grow from their mistakes right, and what they've right. done in life? So that's what we have to allow Bethesda to do as well and every game company out there. If we don't allow people or companies to grow from their mishaps, then we're being very hypocritical because right, we would exactly, want that for ourselves. Exactly. Right? You would want for when you, if you make a mistake for someone to not only tell you like, hey, that ain't it, um, but also to allow you the room to, to be better, um, you know, and, and progress in a positive way. Yeah, exactly. I really think that that this was good to get a lot of this out. I know for a fact I feel my soul is getting a lot more cleansed. We're clearing away <laughs> that bad vibe, that that bad energy. <laughs> all all of the bad energy is go, going out the window into someone else's shoebox that they probably don't use anymore. That's sitting in their closet. Exactly. Let that shit collect dust. Um. So yeah. So let's talk about. Um, <clears throat> let's talk about now that we are through with that, let's talk about representation in gaming, uh, and games, uh, that, that do it well. Hey, okay, let's get cool. into it. I'm ready. I'm ready for this. This is, this is going to be an exciting conversation because there's so many games yeah, that actually do so, it correctly. Uh, let's, I, you know what? I'll let you take that because you are the, the more knowledgeable in terms of like the amount of games. Um, so which games do you feel? Uh, let's say, let's say like top three that do representation really well. I would say top three that do them fairly well are Red Dead Redemption 2 in particular, because they are discussing Native American history, um, the way racism was unfortunately back in the old Western times. They discuss it in a historically accurate way that throughout right. your journey in the game, you see all these different side quests and you see everything that are, they link very well together. The writing was very, very good in that story. Um, okay. Another one is Overwatch. People are probably going to think, why, why, why Overwatch? Well, I'll tell you in a moment. Mm -hmm. And another one that actually you brought to my attention which i had not known about before because i don't play this game so this is more of your expertise is league of legends yes yes we can definitely talk about that um so which do you want to attack first <laughs> let's, let's go <laughs> in for red first. dead redemption first okay. because i let's feel like th that game was a masterpiece um i remember that game was actually gifted to me by one of the lovely community members here and it, it was one of the games that i was so unsure about because i'm not a westerner girl like i normally hate westerner tv shows all that kind of stuff but really? it was one That's that interesting yeah, because, like, I, I don't know what it is. I think it's just, like, the cowboy boots. I don't know, man. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. But going into that game, I, at first, was, like, a bit trepidatious, you know, not gonna lie, but then I heard, like, how funny certain parts of the game were and how well the story was done. Let, let me tell you something, okay? This game literally captivated my heart. Okay, when I got my horse, I named it Lil Nay Nay. Oh, wow. <laughs> okay, I, I literally went all out with this game. Listen, she was making the best raps since 1992, okay? And little Nene got beats. <laughs> it was so much fun. Like, going through, you could literally do anything you wanted within this game. You could attack, uh, what was it, um, the KKK members. There was a yes. side quest for that. There was a side quest for these uh, people who, I think they were, uh, what was it, Nightwalkers? Mm -hmm. I'll have to correct myself later on. 
uh, let me look into that actually because there is there's a side quest for like only these creatures who are, who are basically I think they're people who are cannibals. They come out only at the night and it's oh, a side so quest. Are they, you, you do are they based off of the? So there is a, a just a quick history here. There is a legend um, about the Wendigo, which are these yeah these kind of like they were at one point human, uh, and then through starvation. Um, there is the myth that that the sort of um, kind of corrupting spirit comes in and mutates them where they become this kind of like endlessly hungry creature um, and, and, you know, and they consume. So do you think were the night walkers, were they sort of that kind of these mutated creatures that were consuming things? So the, the I just looked it up right now. They are called the night folk. It's oh, a question written. Yes, I just wanted to make that just a little bit of a, a correction there. They are called the Night Folk, and it's a quest that you can go on in Chapter 2, where it states here, After encountering the Night Folk at least once, a stranger will appear on the road heading to Lagros during the night. An old man sitting at a campfire tells the player about the Night Folk, a murdering group who roam the bayou. And he tells the player that the Night Folk have claimed his house. The player follows him to his house to help clear the Night Folk off of the property during the walk the stranger points to corpses saying the night folk have murdered uh, made their mark here rather mm, interesting so it's very cool it goes okay. in depth with that it goes also in depth with like different um actually racist groups that you can go and hunt and bring them back to your camp and everything like that, like the KKK and yeah. I think uh, another group as well. So this game not only shows the history of several groups that mm -hmm. are, you know, actually still prominently doing their stuff today, yes. <laughs> um, but it shows it accurately. And that's what I love about it. It shows the historicity of the Wild West accurately. And there's one um, thing at the end of the game of where I have to look this up but I believe Arthur gets tuberculosis and mm -hmm. that's one of the things of where at the end of it you see him slowly starting to become slower and become sicker mm -hmm. and it's one of the stories I feel has the most fluid storyline mm. even with the side quests because as you know a lot of side quests can get convoluted right. they can get uh messed up and get lost within the story almost i feel yeah yeah because it's it that's part of open world games uh is is that is that there's all those side quests and if you're not careful you'll get you'll get lost in the game um yeah i have an article here and it's very interesting where um it says the joys of red dead redemption 2's open world are in the details you must eat you must bathe you must shave you must clean your guns uh and that a big part of it is talking about because because the game itself takes place in 1899 um Three years after the Supreme Court legalized racial segregation, midway through the presidency of a man who fought in the Civil War, which means for some fans, era specific racism becomes a part of the experience. Hence why there is uh, slave catchers, KKK inspired clans and racial targeting within the game. So, yeah, this supports, you know, what you're what you're saying about it being accurately uh, portrayed, uh, you know, bits of history here. Yeah, exactly. And actually, uh, the term I just looked it up that is used in the game is called black lung because that's what he has. But it's also tuber tuberculosis mm -hmm. because I think back in the 1800s, they were just finding out about this disease. Mm -hmm. And the reason why it's called black lung, just a little bit of history, is because coal miners used to go down into the depths and they would mine for gold. They would mine for silver. They would mine for other um, bits. And they would have a limited amount of time in there before they would get sick. And eventually, after being in the coal mines, working so many years right. you get a condition called black lung which is basically a f like I see, so like this form of disease that is a tar that builds up in the lungs right. so you you can die from that you get hysteria you get a form of delusions mm -hmm. it's not a pretty sight no for <laughs> sure and tuberculosis and black lung at that time were very um a big big diseases <laughs> yes um, oh yes but to, to you know to bring it back the fact that there that this you know, this game exists where it takes place in a time that's really a part of America's ugly history, you know, uh, and allows it allows for the historical accuracy that like these um, 
the the racist part of it, right? These racists exist and then allows for you as the gamer to fight against it, I think is such a great um not only storytelling device, but it's actually really empowering. Um, because it, you know, I think a big I think a big issue a lot of people face in real life, right? When you come across bullies, whether they be racist or sexist or, you know, pick a thing, but they're a bully, right? Um, and a lot of things people experience in real life with that is not being able to, like, do anything about them, you know? Um, and games and uh, storytelling, it allows for you to go to a space where you can be someone that gets to fight back. You know, so I, I think, frankly, in my opinion, uh, when we speak about racism used as a storytelling device, it is great for educating people. Right. If done with with accuracy um, and also allows for there's an empowerment there. Um, it, racism in gaming is important because it exists. Racism exists. It didn't go away. It's still here, <laughs> you know, and it's very important along with representation because with representation, these people exist, you know, and it's in that acknowledgement that different types of people exist, that these problems exist. We can then find solutions, find empowerment, find education. Um, it's important to have those things in storytelling for that reason, it it benefits us um, as 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 the as the learning creatures that we are. <clears throat> yeah, and it's something of where it, you know it it can be done. Like in Red Dead Redemption, it's done beautifully of where you know you have this story that tells such a vibrant picture. And I feel like when it's done accurately like that, then you're not only enjoying the story, but you're enjoying all of the little bits and bobs that the developer has put in to make the story more come to life, if you will. Right. Yeah. No, I agree. Um, so speaking about Overwatch uh, and, and representation there, um, you know, I think it actually goes pretty well with, with League of Legends. So um, why don't you say your your opinions about the representation in Overwatch, and then I'll talk about League of Legends. So, okay. It's it's one of those things of where I, I have to say, I've been playing Overwatch for a very long time, <laughs> about, what, three or four years. Um, just to give a little bit of a background, my main that I use primarily is either Sombra or Widowmaker. Okay, just want to put that out there in case anybody got, likes the Sombra or Widowmaker. But the, a lot of the time, what I'm seeing in this game as far as representation goes is you see Hispanic, you see Russian, you see Spanish, you see, uh, what is it, you see Middle Eastern, you see people who have uh, Asperger's Syndrome. You see so much representation mm -hmm. in the diversity of so many of their characters. There's an article that I mm -hmm. saw for the representation in this and i want to read a clip of it here because it's it absolutely hits everything on the right. on the head um it says here that we're told that it's impossible to please all the people all the time but this has turned out to be a thin excuse for gaming's lack of diversity for a long time developers and publishers have satisfied themselves with pleasing the small slice of humanity they feel comfortable portraying now coincidentally this male white and east asian demographic also a dominant in de in development retail publishing and yes journalism people get c so comfortable that with this game i feel like it's branching mm -hmm. out and it's doing so many different things. So in for one example, when you're playing Overwatch, you're seeing so many of the characters speak in their native language. Like there's one who speaks in Korean. There's one who will speak in oh, French. Wow. I believe Widowmaker is actually <laughs> French. Yeah. That's amazing. So you see, yeah, you see so much of it. And it was so intriguing to see because like, as me as the player who you know pre you know predominantly speaks English who lives in America seeing all this diversity put into one capsule you see it you know you can see it in so many other games mm -hmm. as well you know if Overwatch can do it then so many right, other games right. can do absolutely. it absolutely well. I agree I agree so um to kind of 
piggyback off of that, right? Um, it literally takes nothing to represent what the world really looks like, even if your characters are not things that exist, you know, in terms of creatures, humanoids with superpowers, you know what I mean? Aliens. Um, while those things don't exist in real life, right? Showing different skin colors, showing people that come from different uh, places within that world, uh, i.e. Lord of the Rings, you have dwarves and elves, hobbits, orcs, you know, um, all these different types of, of, of races, though fantastical, they are really um, showing that that the world, no matter what world it is, is not one thing. And that's so important. So like in the case of Overwatch, to have all these different characters that come from different nations, that, that speak different languages, that look different, is so positive. Not just for the, uh, the aspect of like, if somebody wants to play someone that looks like them, but just to, to show, man, that diversity is beautiful, baby. It's beautiful, you know. It is. Um, that, there, it's that's that's the incredible thing about about diversity, about representation, is to then be able to say, yeah, man, our world is colorful, and that's an amazing thing. Uh, in terms of League of Legends, right? You have everything from humanoid beings to beings that are like part animal, um, part humanoid. You have goddesses demons um creatures that are made of ice there are a hundred and forty no there are more than 140 champions within the game um that are of all different skin colors all kinds of body types they um are like i said before uh, some are creatures some are what are referred to as celestials they're not even you know they're from the heavens like you know Yes, oh, wow. there's a lot of characters here. There are some that are robots. You know what I mean? Like, right. And so <laughs> the, the whole point, right, is that even with these uh, fantastical characters, for example, there's a character called, um, here, I'm looking at the list. There's a character called Blitzcrank. Blitzcrank is literally a robot. Oh right? my gosh, she's so cute. cute. <laughs> but um, obviously, right, we don't have robots walking around that need representation in the real world however to be able to see like this character that's obviously not human and and is this different thing it's super cool it you, you know it is it um, really so is so representation is so important these characters right they have such amazing lore um and actually, my husband, Chris, can, can really speak to this. He's a huge League of Legends fan uh, and gets really deep into the lore of the game. Um, but there is sort of, um, how do I say? It's it's like it's Riot Games are the ones that make League, right? And it's Riot Games' way of maybe discussing racism without, you know, spe specifically mentioning um, a, a race that's in our reality, right? Um, there is right, a, uh, exactly. a war in a place called Demacia where they are, they purposely cast away mages. So anybody who has magic ability gets exiled. Doesn't, yeah, it doesn't matter. Oh, their interesting. Age, it doesn't matter male or female. They get exiled. And there's one in particular, one in particular mage that's um, locked away. And it, uh, League of Legends has a comic, so there is a, a comic that shows that storyline um, of, of that particular mage breaking free and the war he starts in the name of the mages. And so, um, you know, there's it's, it's, it's such an interesting way in which something like racism can be betrayed in storytelling and used to show like, hey people are different from each other and that's okay. And like, this is what it looks like when you marginalize a group of people that it could lead to some very harmful negative events. And if we are as people to be better, how about we learn from our, from our own histories, maybe learn from these stories and be better for it. And that's the key thing that a lot of people have to realize while at the end of the day, yes, it's in quote, just a game, but in reality, mm -hmm. it's a lot 
bigger than that. It's a message. It's a, mm-hmm. a connotative a connotative piece of like you are playing this you're soaking this in it's going to affect you anything that you absorb through mentally it will have an effect and i think that's such a powerful thing on stating what to consume and how you are consuming it because when you consume a game like league of legends overwatch red dead redemption fallout whatever it may be you're consuming a message you're not just consuming a piece of gameplay which is why when people say hey man you know it's just a game you know and that's why i'm like yeah to an extent you are correct but it's also a creative piece Mm -hmm. that has a strong viewpoint behind it right um and it's not just in video games that we see these these um these stories being told and where uh where racism um or just race heavy themes uh can be can be seen um there is for example and i'm going to use dungeons and dragons as an example i i play dungeons and dragons i don't know if there's any dungeons and dragons fans out there but if there are <laughs> um <laughs> i'm going to talk about curse of strahd strahd is a vampire who lives in a land called barovia he's created this sort of mist bubble over the land where no one that goes in can come out Whoever goes into Barovia, into the mists, can't come out. Those who are born in Barovia uh, can't come out (laughs) unless they are Vistani. Now, Vistani is a particular race that lived within Barovia before the mist went up. Uh, According to the story, the Vistani are the one that helped Strahd go from human to vampire and survive. Right? So he kind of grants them uh, amnesty. To be able to come and go from the mist as they please. However, this breeds a a kind of an animosity between others who exist within Barovia and the Vistani. Uh, The way that they treat the Vistani very much echoes that of, um, you know, of racism in the real world. This is to show it, it's sort of like also setting it's also trying to give you a, a the color of this world and art is a is a reflection of life it you really know is. so yeah. in real life if we have racism our storytelling will do the same our artwork will show that it exists as well however that may be if it's in in a fantastical sense like in D or or if it's in a reality sense uh, or historical sense rather um like in red dead redemption so you know i think that showing these these racism uh, or race heavy themes within storytelling is is important for for that reason for showing like this is a part of life. And since it's a, it's an issue that that still hasn't been solved, like we still got racists out here, uh it will it will always be a theme. Exactly. And you know, rightfully so because it's something that, you know, actual people make these games. Why not have actual things that happen in our actual life in the video game, you know? Right, right, right. It it, it I think, and again, as I said before, right, is you get to, in video games, in literature, in movies, you know, we get to see either the the character itself stand up against these, you know, in, in, in the topic of what we're discussing, these racists stand up against them and fight against them, right? Um, there's There is something not just empowering but almost like a relief honestly yeah (laughs) (laughs) that we're that we're afforded in that you know um another good example is uh movie wise right is x-men oh yes exactly yeah yeah so for those who are comic fans (laughs) there are many x-men video games and there are animated uh, tv shows and movies and all that um so X-Men is in the fantastical sense, right? There are mutants and there are humans. And really, mutants are, are still human. They're just further along the evolutionary chain, right? Magneto, 
uh, a character who is an antagonist with especially within the movies right he as a child lives through the holocaust very specifically having been brought to the concentration camps um and so he experiences firsthand what humans do to each other when we, you know we don't understand each other and we see you're different from exactly you. right um and this informs his mentality as an adult in the fact that he is also a mutant and so when things start to happen that echo the time of the holocaust his immediate response is mutants need to rise together and stop this from happening and he is willing to go to violent ends if necessary to protect the mutants and he is very much like humans are not gonna ever understand us they will only hunt us they will only hurt us you know uh and then his formerly best friend professor xavier is like no allow them to to catch up and to understand and to um you know don't let their past actions you know inform what they'll do now don't don't go to such uh, violent or hasty uh, extents um you know when when maybe this time it'll be different you should allow them that space and so that's really in the movies that's like a big core of like their them butting heads essentially and why they are on opposite sides um but what a great movie honestly right? what, though. A, what a great story and it's and it starts right there from from this uh racism being used as a device to tell this really beautifully crafted story about the dangers of us versus them. Exactly. And it, 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 you know, if you guys have played the games, which I've seen people play them, but I haven't. So, uh, for the X-Men games and for the storytelling of X-Men in general, I feel like it really goes so well into what we're discussing, you know, with everything mm -hmm. that Shasta said, because it, mm -hmm. it denotes kind of the say like this history of it, right? It's showing the history. Mm -hmm. It's showing not just like this one sided view. I feel where things get jumbled up to an extent. It's being accurate mm -hmm. and it's giving credit and kind of this loyalty to what the story deserves, which is always needed. Right, right. So, you know, I think and it's really our <laughs> our like mission statement for this podcast, right? Is yeah. is that if you take anything away from this podcast is that we want people to come in maybe learn something new and leave a little bit better than they were before, you know, and, and to realize that there is an importance in having things like racism, like sexism, um, you know, it, it's important to have these things in storytelling, um, and to represent these things accurately so that we as, as, humans are better i couldn't have said any better myself <laughs> <laughs> yeah yeah i just really honestly think that this conversation is always needed and i feel like you know you always have to tread lightly with talking about these kinds of topics that's why sure. whenever you know we discuss something like this we want to make sure because this is a safe space for you guys you know these podcasts mm -hmm. are meant to be something that is not only educational but something fun that we can talk about because it does relate to gaming it does relate to our experiences within this whole gaming stratosphere mm-hmm absolutely absolutely because gaming for those who you know don't <laughs> don't think so just so you know gaming is art okay it is <laughs> gaming is art art is a reflection of life it's art okay it's <laughs> arty art art all right <laughs> said so eloquently yes. by andy beersack of black veil brides thank you tips off yeah. yes <laughs> so i do have a question for you actually because thinking of remakes thinking of games thinking of everything yeah. i i want to know if you were to remake a game that didn't age well which one would you do <laughs> Oh, wow. That's a, that is such a tough question for me. 
That's a tough question for me because there's a I because again I'm not I haven't played like a ton of games in which to know which ones haven't aged well. You know what I'm saying? Oh, okay, okay. Um, yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, but I think I think it is fair to say that any any old game should probably be remade. You know, re- retaken a look at and remade. Um, I will. I'm gonna bring this up. So. Uh, this is uh, an 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 old article, but this is this is to show how important education is, how poor, how important um, the the gaming community in general is in order to have moments where the developers can grow and remake games to make them better. Um, so Nintendo um, for Super Smash Bros. Ultimate, right? Uh, there was a character in there that uh, had some off- offensive imagery, uh, specifically to Native Americans, uh, and how they live streamed it. And then there, the issue was uh, they were showcasing Mr. Game, Mr. Game and Watch, which was a throwback fighter um, from one of Nintendo's early portable games, in which one of his attacks, he dons a feather and he torches his enemies. Now, this is very offensive to Native Americans, right? Um, and, and so people went to the developers and said, hey, this is fucked up. This is racist. And Nintendo responded with, you know what? That's right. So let's come out with a patch where we remove that entirely uh, from, the, from the game. Uh, and, and, you know, now we no longer have Mr. Game & Watch putting a feather and... and lighting people on fire exactly yeah so i think my answer to your question is going to be that every older game could use a good look at and a remake exactly i i completely agree with that because like with that example i i feel like so many uh game developers it really shows you their character and it shows you the kind of like cojones that they <laughs> have yeah. the moralities in a sense mm-hmm. to back up their product and i feel like that just shows them backing up the product in a moral way mm-hmm. of where okay we're gonna take a look at what we did and you know we're sorry about that yeah absolutely absolutely so I feel like w- what should be our final topic? Because we've discussed a lot. Like we threw a <laughs> lot at people. We were just like, okay, here's information. Chug. <laughs> <laughs> it's true. You know, um, oh gosh. Well, as a final, as a final thing, um, I, I, you know what it, I'm going to say? I implore everybody to take a look at their games that they play pay attention to those storylines don't just take it for face value um and and see what you find see what you find in the storytelling uh how does it relate to to real life to real life experience of experiences of people that are different from you and and you know maybe become more aware of that very well said i completely agree and also i just want to leave off on another note i know it's been said before but wash your damn hands (laughs) seriously yes wash your hands wear your mask i know (laughs) i know we want to give you all these different public service announcements and pieces of knowledge about gaming and everything but i feel like we still have a panic going on we Mm -hmm. still have a pandemic Mm -hmm. covid is still with us Wear your mask, wash your hands stay six feet apart from people i'm seeing people hugging in the store okay we can't have this Let's let's just be careful, okay? <laughs> let's be careful out there. Let's uh, let's be cognizant of each other, and uh, and and try to create a better world for each other by by just being aware. <laughs> like, just- Honestly, like just be fucking aware of your surroundings and understand that you have the power. Okay. Right. You have the power to control things. Yes. But I feel like while you're giving good information, I'm just here trying to be like an ass and just trying to order people around. No, you're fantastic. <laughs> Stop it. Your your opinions and thoughts are absolutely valid as much as mine. Um, and you know, we 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 speak for not just um, ourselves, but I think I think us having these conversations is also a representation of of um girls in gaming you know um girls as storytellers uh i think 
even with you being Jewish and myself being Latina, I am a, a woman of color. And, you know, these conversations are important to show like, hey, we have opinions on this. And you know what? You're going to hear us. Oh, yeah, absolutely. Mm -hmm. And if you don't want to hear us, you're still going to hear us because our videos are probably going to be recommended to you in your YouTube feed. OK, <laughs> yeah, <laughs> there's no escaping us. Literally, we are everywhere. All right. <laughs> Yes, we are. Yes, we are. <laughs> I love the fact that we can be everywhere because we're like ninjas. If we don't know when something's going to happen, you don't know when we're about to hit. We're just there. Yes. <laughs> In the shadows. <laughs> we're lurking like a cat. <laughs> yes, yes. Oh, man. But you guys, I just want to thank you all for listening, for tuning in, for watching if you're on the YouTubes and everything like that, which I sound like an old granny. The YouTubes, honey. <laughs> Chastity, what are you watching tonight? Her, we're watching the YouTubes. <laughs> it's going to be me and my kids when they're grown. <laughs> <laughs> if you can even, like, imagine them growing. No, I don't think you want to imagine that thought process. No, I got some time before I get there. For sure. <laughs> You might want to stock up on Excedrin right now. <laughs> <laughs> but you guys, thank you so much for joining us. If you all like our faces and what we do, please be sure to subscribe if you're on YouTube and follow if you are on Spotify. And you guys, thank you so much for the love that we received on the last podcast. It was really awesome to see you guys are loving Chastity. And I just appreciate you guys with my whole ass heart. So thank you so much. And yeah, stay casually nerdy. I will see you all in the next video and we will both see you in the next podcast take care you guys Bye. peace